Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 551 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me, Please, and Other Stories. Publishers Weekly says... Visceral settings and robust characters will have readers marveling at how much Kirtley is able to fit into a limited page count. For SFF fans with no time to sink into a doorstopper, these concentrated doses of genre goodness will hit the spot. And Kirkus Reviews writes, Kirtley employs sharp, concise prose that complements his puckish sense of humor. The author's passionate voice breathes life into this wonderful array of tales. So again, the book is called Save Me Please and Other Stories. And it's available now on Amazon.com. And today on the show, we'll be discussing the classic 2006 science fiction novel Blind Sight by Peter Watts. And this will involve spoilers for everything in the book, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Teresa DeLucci, making her 17th appearance on the show. She reviews books, TV, and video games for Den of Geek and Tor.com. And her short fiction appears in Strange Horizons, Weird Horror, and Lightspeed. Her short story, Only My Skin That Crawled Away, received an honorable mention in Ellen Datlow's The Year's Best Horror, Volume 14. So, Teresa, welcome to the show. Hello. Then next up, we've got Sam J. Miller, making his 11th appearance on the show. He's the Nebula Award-winning author of the novels The Blade Between, Blackfish City, The Art of Starving, and Destroy All Monsters. And his short fiction appears in magazines such as Strange Horizons and Lightspeed. His short story collection, Boys, Beasts, and Men, recently won a Locus Award and is nominated for a World Fantasy Award. So, Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. And also joining us today is Seth Dickinson, making his eighth appearance on the show. He's the author of the Baru Cormorant series of fantasy novels and the upcoming science fiction novel, Exordia. And he's also a 10-year contributor to Bunchy's hit video game, Destiny. So, Seth, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Okay, so let's start off with Teresa. And have you tell us about your history reading, Blind Sight? Um, yeah, I read this when it first came out because I was a really big fan of Peter Watts' first series, uh, Rifters, um, which was Starfish was the first book in that. And I just love his dark sensibility. I'm not a huge hard SF reader, but I really like his um, dark take on things. Do you remember how you discovered him in the first place, like the Rifters series in the first place? Well, because I worked at Tor Books at the time, they all came out. So um, I knew the editor and read them as manuscripts before they were published. Oh, that's cool. So um, so what was that like reading the, the pre-publication manuscripts? Well, again, I had never really read a lot of hard science fiction, but um, his concepts really intrigued me. And, you know, the editor at the time told me that it was really, really dark and he thought that I would like it. And he was absolutely correct. And so then if you kept reading Peter Watts. uh, Yeah, pretty. uh... Yeah, I kept on reading him. I read the whole Rifter series, and then I've read some of his short fiction. He wrote a really great short story based on John Carpenter's The Thing that I really enjoyed. So, yeah, I've been following him around for a while now. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Peter Watts back in episode 315, and so at that time I read his short story collection Beyond the Rift and his novella The Freeze Frame Revolution and that... um the the John Carpenter pastiche it's called the things is in beyond the rift and it's it's absolutely fantastic and so if you're interested in that uh, I would definitely recommend reading that and then checking out that interview because we we talked quite a bit um, uh, about that in that interview um, but so then how about Seth uh, what's your history reading Blind Sight I cannot remember how I got to it but Blind Sight is posted as just like a text only like free web page on the, on his site rifters and somehow i got started reading that um it's completely sucked in it was the first thing of his i'd read it's kind of my comfort read now i go back to that uh htm text version quite a bit um and since then i've read a bunch of his other work but any story i came up with for how i found blind sight in the first place would be you know just an illusion a lie in retrospect <laughs> 
Um, cause yeah, I mean, you, you, I remember you have told me about blindsight over the years. It seems like it has, it made a big impression on you. Like when I read your stuff, like, um, three bodies at Mitanni, I feel like I can detect a, uh, a Peter Watts influence. Yeah. I think he's actually name checked in that story. Um, he was a pretty big influence on me. And I remember I definitely read the book before I went to grad school, lest I sound impressive, um, it was a very good PhD program, but I dropped out after a year. Uh, and it was in what we were supposed to call social neuroscience when we wanted grant money, but it was really social psychology, um, you know, psych with brain scans. And the stuff he talked about in his books um, really, really fascinated me. And although it didn't bear much on the research I was doing, it was great for talking about at cocktail parties and late night beer sessions. So, so did reading Blind Sight play a role in you wanting to go into that field, or was that were you already heading in that direction when you discovered it? I was already headed that way. I would be very worried if anyone told me that Blind Sight inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw Seth your your upcoming novel, Extorty. It has a Peter Watts blurb on the front, right? Yeah, I uh, I asked him for an early blurb. Um, we'll probably get into this later, but like Blind Sight was such a tipping point for me. And I think at the time I wasn't a writer, but you know, for the whole science fiction field, like in terms of writing anything about the alien or the non-human, even like AIs of the type we see today, where it's just a, you know, a, a neural net, like Blindsight asks some questions that I think everyone has to answer now when they're thinking about non-human intelligence that maybe you wouldn't have thought of before. So anything I write about aliens, about AI, I'm thinking about blindsight. Have you interacted much with Peter Watts or do you just kind of email him out of the blue and say, would you yeah, word my we, book? We definitely, we've traded a few Facebook messages, a um, couple emails. I got him some very light work because uh, I currently work on a um, an underwater game. Uh, I think I'm allowed to say that. And he was a marine biologist is my understanding. Um so I looped him in to, you know, consult on some stuff, take a look at some fish. Uh, trying to pay back a little bit of that inspiration he brought me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he has a PhD in in marine biology, I think. Um, yeah, cool. And then I know, Sam, you, uh, this is your, and I'll, I'll explain, I guess, this is my first time reading Blind Sight. I, um, you know, I just heard Seth talk about it a lot. And then I used to um, be a regular on the Print SF board on Reddit. And just anytime anybody asked for a book recommendation on any topic, they were just bombarded with uh, appeals to read Blindsight, just like Blindsight, Blindsight, Blindsight. So I knew it was, you know, a book that had this really um, passionate uh, readership, but I'd, I'd never read it until now. Um, and I know, Sam, this is your first time reading Blindsight as well. So kind of um, did you know anything about it going in? Like, or what were your uh, expectations going in? So I, I also had like a really formative experience with um, his short story, The Things. Um, the Thing is one of my favorite movies. And besides the fact that The Things is a brilliant story, it's such a badass move to just be like, I'm going to totally write fanfic about this IP and I'm going to publish it and it's going to be amazing. Um, and that was a big inspiration for me because I also have a lot of strong feelings about the thing. And I wrote <laughs> a story called uh, things with beards that was also published in Clark's world where the things was published. Um, and it got a Nebula nomination and it's one of the things I'm, I'm more proud of, of mine. And so like, yeah, Peter Watts gave me permission to write thing fanfic. Um, and, uh, and so, so I'm a, I'm a fan, but I'm also intimidated and terrified. And, um, you know, there's just this like incredible, like miasma of intelligence that comes off of, of everything I've, I've read of his, um, so much so that I'm, I'm, I'm scared. And, and in fact, the, 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 the gloss on blindsight being hard SF made me feel like there, I was not, I would be in my nineties before I would be grown up enough to, to <laughs> be able to understand that book. Um, which is interesting. I feel like that it does it a real disservice. Um, because like, this is like a straight up horror novel. Um, and reading it now, it was really exciting because it is like incredibly hard SF, um, like way too hard for me, but I can just like, you know, uh, roll with that and just assume it's smarter than me. And then ultimately get to some really brilliant horror. 
Well, yeah, I guess we should explain that this book has 16 pages of endnotes with 133 footnotes, mostly to scientific journals. So there is a lot of science in this book, um, probably more than any other book I, I've read <laughs> that I can, you know, any novel that I can think of. Uh, maybe something else will come to me, but there is a lot of and a lot of different science from different um, different disciplines. You know, you've got. Yeah, like Seth was saying, like neuroscience and linguistics and, you know, just all kinds, you know, oceanography or, you know, marine biology, just all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so Sam's kind of going, since you had never read this before, kind of what was your, what were your initial impressions? Like when you started reading it, um, kind of what did you think of the first couple chapters? I loved the opening scene. I think it's a really brilliant, like it, it, it roots you so powerfully in the human um, and the sort of like basic, like emotional, universal um, narrative of the schoolyard bully and the revenge on the schoolyard bully and the like, um, just like that, that whole scene and, and, and the, and series like relationship with his friend and, and the way his friend is horrified by this like selfless gesture, <laughs> this like, you know, the thing he's done for him um, is just so powerful. And, and it, I, it really speaks to the storytelling skill here because it really, it rooted me so strongly that I just coasted along on a lot of, I mean, if I say gibberish, it's going to sound like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm condemning it. I'm not. It's like what, what to me felt like hearing, you know, you know, the, the, the parent, the, the teacher talk in, um, in peanuts, right? It's like, oh, I'm not, I don't know, this is too smart for me. Um, but but I, I rolled with it because I had been, they had done such a good job of establishing early on that this, whatever else this book did, it was going to like tell a story about human people um, who are in some ways augmented, but in other ways, like super, super, super just baseline human. Yeah, and I'll I'll try to give a, a a brief synopsis as we go through. I mean, I just um before we started recording, I was talking to my wife and I gave her a synopsis of the novel and it took like an hour to <laughs> explain everything. So it's going to have to be more abbreviated than that. But um but I'll do my best. But but yeah, so so our main character is this person Siri Keaton and this is in the future, decades in the future. And he's had a radical hemispherectomy where half of his brain has been removed to uh, treat epilepsy. And as a result, he's kind of uh, emotionally affectless and, uh, you know, really has difficulty relating to people. And he has become a uh, synthesist. Is that the right word? Uh, where basically I think they have these sort of AI, these super advanced AIs, and his job is to explain as best as a mere human can to to everybody else what the AIs are doing or what they're, you know, explain their behavior. Uh, so how about somebody who's read this before? Uh, Teresa, am I, am I correct so far? I think so. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as Sam. Where it's like I approach this kind of like how I approach maybe something like William Gibson or Gene Wolfe even. Where it's like I know there's something really big and deep going on, but I don't always understand it. But I'm here for the humans. But I think you've got the basic plot elements correct. Okay. Yeah. If, if I say anything and anyone thinks anything I've said is incorrect, feel free to jump in and, and we can talk about it. Um, but but um, Siri's story is sort of developed through flashbacks. And through these flashbacks, we basically learn that his mother has entered this VR environment called Heaven and is sort of, you know, out of the picture. And his dad is a, um, we, we gather some sort of government official or intelligence operative or something who um, is always away on mysterious ops. Um, and so the the actual sort of inciting incident of the story is that all these alien probes appear around Earth and kind of take a flash photo scan of the whole planet at once. And that's the only contact humanity has had with these, with, with these aliens or any aliens. And so we know that they've you know, take an, int an interest in us or scan the planet, but we don't know anything about their agenda. And then Siri gets a message from his dad uh, saying that 
we know where one of these alien ships is and they're sending an expedition to go check it out and they want Siri in his synthesis capacity to go along on the mission. Um, how about Seth? Uh, since you've read this book a bunch of times, you want to jump in here and tell us uh, uh, tell us a bit about the the crew. Who's who are some of the the characters in this book? Yeah. Um, so Siri is our point of view character in more ways than one. We get everything through his eyes, uh, but he's tagging along on this crew of transhumans, I guess. Uh, each of which has their own quirky. Um, way of trying not to be obsolete. So his the closest he gets to a friend, Isaac, uh, is the mission biologist. And Isaac has been uh, so deeply connected to the machines around him. Like every neuron in his brain um, is hooked up to some sort of outboard sensor or scalpel or robotic arm that his body just trembles constantly. Um, his, he's like overloaded. Uh, there's a linguist. Um, Susan, uh, Susan James, and her gimmick. Uh, I shouldn't call it a gimmick because it's a core <laughs> part of her identity, but um, her brain has been partitioned into four separate people. Um, herself, Michelle, Sasha, and Crusher. And the idea is that she can work on more than one problem at the same time because she has these different cores. Um, and there's a little bit of interesting cultural backstory where she talks about how people like her really don't like the old language of like alters and split personality and disassociative identity because in the future of blindsight, it's been proven that um, the human brain, maybe for a large chunk of its evolutionary history, had multiple different personalities inside. And only relatively recently did we integrate into this idea of one, um, you know, unitary consciousness. Uh, the, Third member of the crew, um, Amanda Bates. And I, I, if I could go back in time, the first editorial note I would give Watts is that you really shouldn't have Amanda Bates and Susan James in the same crew. Yeah, 100% agree. <laughs> I, I had trouble telling them apart, but I think they're both based on real people. So anyway, um, she's kind of the, uh, the heavy, the military specialist. But both in the narrative and in the world, one thing she struggles with is that she's completely obsolete. Um, her troops are all drones. Uh, they call them grunts and they, they would work better if she didn't interfere with them at all. Um, <laughs> she's really just there as sort of a sop to the idea that military robots need human oversight. And then there's the captain um, and the captain is a vampire. And I think a lot of people have a knee jerk reaction. Like I thought I was getting into a serious science fiction, book. <laughs> but Watts has taken the concept of the vampire more seriously than maybe anyone in history. <laughs> um, and the ship also has an AI, but it's not really a speaking character for most of the story. Um, the reason they have a vampire as a captain is that uh, I'm sure we'll dive into this more later, but like um, vampires are a proto human species, kind of like Neanderthals um, or hobbits, Florians, I think they're called. Um, and these vampires went extinct about 700,000 years ago. I can't remember the numbers, but um, they've been resurrected Jurassic Park style uh, because they have very valuable cognitive abilities. They're very good at solving certain kinds of problems that humans and AIs are not. And they put one in charge because he's a predator. They figure um, as an organism that evolved to prey on humans, he's going to be a little sharper, a little more ruthless. Uh, and, the the terror the rest of the crew feels towards him is uh, definitely a major theme in the book. Yeah, okay, that's that's an excellent uh, introduction to our cast of characters here. I want to come back to Teresa and say, so so you had read this before, but now you're coming back to it. I guess, sorry, did you say how long is how long it had been since you last read this? Uh, probably two thousand and five. Okay, so so what was it like after all that time coming back to these characters? Kind of how did they strike you? Um, well, all right. There was another character on board, Robert Cunningham. He was Isaac's backup, another biologist, but I thought he was the most redundant one because he's very easy to forget. <laughs> um, coming back to it, I think I knew what I was getting into more. And because I had read it before, I could take my time appreciating the prose and really 
chewing over some of the the heavier ideas in it that might have gone over my head because at first it was for me it was all ooh vampires in space hell yes you know and then it was you know the problems that the crew is facing and and the bigger questions for the future of humanity so i definitely think i absorbed a lot more this is definitely a book that you know just gets richer the more you read it i mean seth was saying he had a little trouble sometimes keeping Amanda Bates and Susan James straight. And um, and this is one of my one of my criticisms of the book is I had a little trouble keeping the characters straight. They they all sort of felt a little samey in terms of their personalities and their voice. And they all seem to really be into uh, giving lectures about biology and stuff like that. So I didn't, I'm just curious I don't if other people... Yeah, I didn't feel that way. Okay. I, I thought they were mostly very distinct, although... You know, like reading it, just like visually, like Bates and and James, like the way that they kept describing them, it did get a little confusing. But I really liked Susan in particular, like the gang of four. And I did feel the the dialogue for all of the different people inside. They felt distinct to me. Um, And I just thought they, you know, there definitely was a lot of exposition and definitely some lectures but it it helped me appreciate watts's kind of madness i guess like (laughs) how deeply he dove into vampire um physical aspects like the biology of that I, i thought that was really interesting to me and i felt that um you know, it, it helped propel like just kind of knowing where the story was going and, and just getting reminded again by going back to it. I definitely absorbed a lot more. I guess we should I should also explain. So in the flat in series flashback sections, um, we find out in addition to his mother and father, who I mentioned, there's also his love interest, Chelsea, who is sort of like a therapist, I guess, but uses kind of some sort of, I don't know neuroscience or something to manipulate people's brains to to make them happier and she's always kind of trying to talk siri into letting her do this to him and he kind of declines and we see and they have this sort of rocky relationship because he's so you know as a result of his um hemispherectomy you know has such problems relating emotionally to other people and is very sort of um analytical and uh and this kind of drives her crazy. So what did you think, Teresa? What did you think of that that relationship or those flashback sections? I loved it. I mean, those were the the elements of the book that really pulled me along when I was getting confused by some of the, the plot points that were happening in outer space. You know, I'm like, oh, okay, here's something I could really focus on, like how Siri relates to his, you know, the people around him after this operation, you know, I mean, he really describes himself as a sociopath. And, you know, with with Chelsea, it was interesting seeing him in that romantic relationship, because it just told you so much also about the world of human interaction around them. Like you had mentioned, Siri's mom uploaded herself into the afterlife, into heaven. And, you know, reading about serious relationship with Chelsea, it's like people in this future aren't even having physical sex. Like that is obsolete. So to see him in this romantic situation was really interesting and it's discomfort and how it wasn't always clicking. And I think what made that interesting was, you know, Siri is a synthesis for the crew. So he's not actually interpreting the AI to the crew. It's more like he's interpreting the crew and reporting them to Earth. You know, so it's another layer of him always having this element of the people around him don't really trust him, except for Chelsea in these in these flashbacks who's trying to have this relationship with them. So I thought it was just a really nice juxtaposition. Yeah, no, I agree. I I really liked the flashback stuff because, yeah, I found the characters very distinct. um, And, you know, there was sort of more, like you say, it was a little bit more relatable. And so it made a nice contrast with the the outer space stuff, which, you know, was sometimes a little bit more, uh, a little more confusing or, um, you know, a little bit harder to to get a handle on. 
Um, but but so so in this outer space, so so I mentioned yeah. So they send um, these these crew on this ship called Theseus out to investigate this alien ship, uh, and this alien ship is kind of like a big uh, Jupiter style planet called Big Ben. And then there's a alien vessel called Rorschach, or that calls itself Rorschach, that's sort of in orbit around Big Ben. And it's kind of, it's described as like this crown of thorns, kind of dark thing with glowing red light seeping out in between the seams or something along those lines. Um, and so, uh, so Sam, kind of what did you, uh, what you think when they start, when, when the, the Rorschach uh, aliens enter the story? Yeah, I mean, just to to um, so I think Seth said really powerfully one of the things that this book and and Peter Watts in general, in my experience, does really well, which is like imagining the alien in a way that feels real and true. And I can I feel like I can count on like like less than two hands how many times like in all the science fiction that I've consumed, how many times like something really feels alien. Um, as opposed to something like a you know a, the the Star Trek model of like a green skinned person, hmm. um, like alien the the truly alien is like really challenging to imagine. And there's nothing wrong with you know the green skinned aliens; um, uh, those have like lots of really compelling science fictional uses. Um, but yeah, um, the the whole ways that that the, the the technology is described and the 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 biology is described when we meet the the scramblers yeah yeah, um, scramblers. <laughs> uh, yeah it's just it's really it's really interesting it's like again like much of it goes way over my head in a way when i can't quite tell like is that because it's really good um and really smart or is it just like really sophisticated hand wavy where it's like you know uh, i will dazzle you with science and you will cease asking questions about this um you know and, and i so so it, it does that extraordinarily well and i think um Siri is such a brilliant choice as a narrator here. And I think it's, it's part of why I struggle to like, you know, find anything bad to say about this book. Like, you know, one wants to have something critical to say. Um, uh, and, and like many of the things that I, that I struggled with are often things that actually are like, could trace back to character, like positive character traits that Siri has. So like, you know, someone mentioned, um, you know, struggling to tell some of the characters apart. And that makes a lot of sense when it comes to like Siri's inability to parse humanity and his struggle to like, you know, figure out who is who and what is what and what makes them them. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, um, the, the, the aliens, Rorschach, the interactions, the conversations they had, um, they're all like often, like, um, you know, we, we, we have Siri as, as both like a hyper intelligent, but also a deeply stupid stand in, in the story. And I think it, it's, it works really, really well. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, in terms of the criticisms, I mean, I do think that this is, you know, it's, it's not super accessible. And I mean, if you're, I, I mean, this is like catnip for hard science fiction fans. Like if you're a hard science fiction fan, this is going to be like your favorite book or one of your favorite books of all time. But this is not, in my opinion, a book to give to someone who's not <laughs> a science fiction reader to convince them to read science fiction, unless they're, I don't know, I guess it depends on the individual, but, um, but that's just something to be aware of. It, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it requires a fair amount of concentration and focus and, knowledge of tropes and everything to to really make heads or tails of a lot of the stuff in this book um does everyone does everyone agree with that does anyone disagree with that in any way oh i, I can dig it i think that's that's fair <laughs> yeah okay so um so yeah so they they meet rorschach this alien vessel and they have this weird they're able to communicate with it and it turns out it speaks english or you know broadcasts in english but um, I think I think they're speaking English uh, in, in human, you know, human language anyway. Um, but it's sort of it has this sort of weird personality where it uh, is on the surface. Uh, I don't know if friendly is the words, you know, is polite or, or whatever. But um, but it's just sort of weird. And so the linguist, after interacting with it for for a while, concludes that it is not actually sentient. 
and is is a Chinese room. So it's is something that is a, a a language processing system that isn't actually aware. Uh, and so as a result of this, they decide that they're going to the vampire captain decides they're going to enter the the alien structure and see what they can find out on the inside. So, uh, so Seth, is that all correct? And kind of what did you think of all of that sort of this section of the story? Yeah, no, that is correct. And one thing I like about it is that, um, so the whole instigating event of the story is that these aliens have taken a snapshot of our planet. It makes sense that they also know our language too, but Blindside is a really, really good haunted house story. And Mm -hmm. I think most people can agree that, you know, if the haunted house starts talking to you and explaining itself, it it cheapens a little bit of the thrill of the unknown. Um, And Watts does something really clever where by introducing this Chinese room, you know, they're radioing Rorschach, it's talking back, but the linguist gradually figures out that um, the aliens aren't really speaking in a way that indicates they understand what they're saying. It's kind of like talking to chat GPT. Um, they're kind of just picking the most probable things to say that statistically fit. They don't have any idea of the content of language. And eventually she realizes, the linguist, um, Amanda, that, uh, sorry, Susan. No. <laughs> no, Susan. <laughs> um, she realizes that, like, they're not talking to an alien at all. There's just the uh, Rorschach's equivalent of a, I don't know, a holding room or a, uh, like, a phone app. Um, And what that does narratively is it it doesn't pull back the curtain. Um, They're exchanging information with these aliens, but they're not getting anything back. You never really get the, uh, you haven't really met the aliens yet. Um, I think that's super clever narratively. I think it's super clever from a speculative standpoint because, um, yeah, any advanced alien would probably have some kind of translator. um, But it's not the same as talking to the aliens themselves. Uh, and of course, it backdoors in all these ideas the book really grapples with later about like, is there any value to really understanding what you're doing, to knowing why you're acting? Um, and the Chinese room pretty cleverly gets to that. It's saying the aliens don't need to understand our language to talk to us. Uh, they're just playing for time. Yeah, so I guess we might as well just get into these aliens. So, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of plot stuff that happens where they, you know, I think they, somehow they get their hands on a dead alien and then they get two live aliens that they're studying. And there's all sorts of weird stuff that happens on the ship where I guess the ship is full of um, like electromagnetic radiation and it's causing all sorts of weird neurological symptoms and all the stuff that you read about in the man who mistook his wife for a hat is all, you know, happening to the crew. Um, but, but eventually they sort of get their hands on some of these aliens who are, yeah, like Sam said, they call the scramblers. <laughs> That's right. Right. The scramblers, yeah. um, who are these kind of, yeah, like octopus or starfish like aliens. Um, but they seem to have no brains. Um, and so that's a bit of a conundrum, uh, for how are they, uh, doing all this, you know, flying through between the stars and sending radio broadcasts if they have no brains. So, uh, so Teresa, what'd you think of all this, uh, all this weird alien squid stuff? <laughs> I mean, I'm always here for alien squids. I agree with Sam, like the aliens here felt so alien. Um, you know, I feel like I'm probably a little phobic of outer space. Like, I feel like it's scary and dark and cold and unknowable. And Peter Watts just nailed it here. Um, the scene that really got me and was really well done, you know, again, it's that haunted house thing was when it was kind of that first contact scene where Siri's in the room with the scrambler, um, but he can't see it. But everyone else, I'm like, the HUD display can, I think I was reading that right. It's like, it's right in front of you. It's right in front of you, but because of the electromagnetic waves or potentially Siri's brain and how he perceives things after his operation, like he couldn't see it, but everyone else could was so terrifying. It reminded me of like that scene in aliens where, you know, they're looking at their, their radar and the aliens are like coming in through the ceiling, you know, that tension was there. Um, I loved all of that. You know, again, it reminded me a lot in some ways now of uh, Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Like, 
these aliens that are so unknowable and you know what are they going to do what are they what do they want you know what do we mean to them and you know i had never heard of a chinese room before reading this book so that was really interesting to go down a little rabbit hole in wikipedia about that and try to wrap my head around it it's funny you mentioned aliens because this was like for me this was, reminded me a lot of prometheus this is mm. like prometheus if you reverse the polarity on its intelligence you would get uh, blind sight. I was just going to say, was, if Prometheus had anyone intelligent involved in its creation, <laughs> it, you might you might end up here. Right. I, I mean, the thing with the aliens being um, invisible, the way I read it was that apparently there's something with your the way your eye works where it's kind of like taking snapshots and then just sort of stitching them together. Your brain sort of stitches them together. And so these aliens are able to kind of like... Uh, and, and your brain sort of throws out everything that it sees in between. And so the aliens are sort of able to like hold still and move and hold still and move and hold still and move in exactly the right way that your your brain just writes them out of existence. But it only works for one person at a time. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the, you know, just the, the book is just stuffed, like overstuffed with amazing science and cool ideas. And so that was one of them uh, for me, for sure. Yeah, I think the real horror of the book is always about, you know, the aliens are scary, but the things they reveal about you, about your own mind, are the real terror that Blindside's trying to deliver. Just the idea that your eyes don't work the way you think that they do. Um, you know, looking around, thinking really hard about yourself like a philosopher, you would never know that there's a network of blood vessels in front of your eyes creating a blind spot, and your brain just screens it out. The scene we're talking about with the scrambler hiding from Siri in plain sight is about the alien exploiting that same physiological trick. We can't see anything that stays stationary relative to our eyeballs. The only way we can see anything out in the world is by jiggling our eyes around. They're called saccades, these tiny muscle motions, so that even something stationary like a tree is moving relative to our eyes so it doesn't fade out of existence. It's kind of creepy to think about. Yeah, I yeah mean, so, it is. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I mean, so Seth, as someone who did a, a good chunk of a degree in uh, neuro, was it neuroscience or sociology or well, neuro, whatever? Let, it was. Let's say social psych. <laughs> social yeah. psych. Uh, what? What? Do you have anything to add about any of that stuff? Like where? Um, I forget if it's Amanda or Susan James. Uh, I think it was Amanda says, you know, I'm dead and and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's like my favorite scene in the book. It's so creepy. Um, so there is this delusion occasionally observed in patients called the Cotard delusion, uh, if I pronounce that right, where people yeah. become convinced they don't exist. Um, and not in an abstract way, very viscerally. They'll say like their flesh is rotting. They'll try to tear off their own limbs because they think it's something alien. It's connected to them. And it's just a malfunction. You know, I think Blindside explains this well. There's a meter in your head that, you know, says... This thing I'm looking at is part of me. And if that meter glitches out and tells you when you look at your arm, like, this thing isn't mine, you'll believe that. Um, these things absolutely do happen. Uh, this is not to say, like, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Blindsight argues about human cognition. But it does a really, really good job of using the weirdness of the human mind gone awry uh, as a source of horror and thrills. Yeah, I yeah. remember hearing about Cotard's delusion in Hannibal there was a really the tv show Hannibal there was a really great um, episode or two about a character with that and then again in uh, Luther on the BBC um, it's a really terrifying concept that definitely isn't super overused in horror but when I've seen it used it's used to great effect and yeah I agree with Seth this was terrifying yeah, and so then the the sort of great mind blowing twist, or a sort of you know conceit of this novel, is that self awareness, that consciousness, is actually just sort of an evolutionary mistake, and that intelligence operates better without consciousness, and that all you know intelligent life in the universe is not conscious, and 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 so these aliens. Um, the fireflies, uh, the scramblers are not conscious, but they are intelligent. And 
sort of the implication is that our consciousness is just sort of a a weakness that will eventually cause us to be uh you know overtaken by superior intelligences so uh so sam what did you think of that that idea mm-hmm. Super fun, super chill, you know, <laughs> love it. Um, yeah, the thing about like humans pointing to their own, um, you know, un- unchallenged supremacy as evidence of superiority is, but but then so did the, do- that was what the dodos would have said before like new people showed up and, and exterminated them is like, like, I did not need this. Um, <laughs> I mean, I did need this, um, but also it's like crushing. Um, so yeah, I, I, the, the, the conceits of 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 what consciousness is and what humanity is and what intelligence is um, are all really brilliant, and the 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 ways in which they're sort of couched inside this like grow the growing horror of the narrative is so is so well done because it's not just that like oh the vampire has commanded us to board the city sized bleeding crown of thorns in space. <laughs> to meet with unspeakable horror. Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, that's what we're going to go do. Um, you know, is, is just such a, is just like, you know, another escalation, like across all these, these different levels of like the ways in which this, this book is horrifying. Um, so, so yeah, the, I, I have a real, it's actually like, I don't know if it's a, a phobia or just a bias of mine, but I have a very short, um, a, a low bar for discussions of like things like do we have free will and um, it are we con- are we conscious are we sentient um, because I think they're often those those conversations are often really like shallow and dumb um, but this that is not the case here it's like oh no this this actually kind of like convinced me um, that 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 sentience is 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 either a fiction or a liability or both. Yeah, I wonder if we should maybe come back to that. I mean, because I, I think <laughs> Peter, well, Peter Watson, you know, you were quoting a little bit from his end notes there. Um, I guess I'll read what he. If I can oh, not in, not there. intentionally. They just permeated my brain. I guess. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to jump to jump the gun. Um, but he says basically that um, you know that this the 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 view put forward in this novel is just kind of an interesting thought experiment that isn't necessarily what he believes. Um, but, but it, it could, it could be, I guess, uh, I can't, eh, I can't find the exact quote. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, I guess there's some other plot stuff. Maybe I'll just read, cause there's a ton of stuff ha- that happens toward the end of this book and a lot of twists and revelations and stuff like that. And some stuff I'm still honestly a little, confused about so maybe maybe i can throw out some of these things and you guys can can help me so so one thing is that there's this whole issue of why do they enter rorschach to begin with isn't this taking a gigantic risk i mean rorschach even says to them as they're approaching are you trying to start a war um and um i i think i pretty much get it by the end it's been explained but I don't know if uh, Seth, what do you what do you think about this uh, this whole idea of antagonizing aliens who are capable of interstellar travel when you're not? Yeah. Um, so, to the book's credit, that is brought up pretty early. Like the question of can there even be like do we have a chance against this thing? Um, should we even be trying to fight it? Uh, the linguist Susan, you know repeatedly asserts like we should be trying to talk to it. Um, There's a huge philosophical debate in the background. like the whole planet is arguing about whether technology implies belligerence. Like does the fact that these aliens are able to travel between stars mean that they're peaceful or does it mean they're here to kill us? Um, And as a plot device, the way actually, actually Seth, let's, let's unroll that a little bit because I thought that was really interesting. So, so yeah, so, so he says that there's the optimists, the pessimists and the historians. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you want to explain that or or should I? Yeah. Yeah. I'll go for it. Um, Basically the optimists are people like Carl Sagan uh, who believe that anybody who's gained the ability to travel between the stars uh, and has the patience and the resources to do it, must also kind of have control of themselves. They would have 
faced a crisis where they gained the ability to destroy themselves like we have with nuclear weapons. And if they're here now, it means they overcame that. You know, they've lifted up the better angels of their nature. Um, against them, the pessimists say there's nobody out there. Um, you know, life is so rare and fragile. But that school of thought is kind of overturned by the fact that the aliens do show up and take our picture. Uh, and the historians argue that technology arises from the need to adapt to a hostile environment. And it comes packaged with this implicit assumption that it's you against the universe. So anything that has continued to develop its technology to the point where it can travel between the stars must have faced obstacles so powerful um, and so awful that it probably sees itself as the alien force probably sees itself as in competition with the universe and everything in it. You know, this is a stance you kind of see in three body problem um, or other pessimistic science fiction where uh, if something is out there and it has the motive to want to go out there and travel between the stars, it also probably has the motive to want to kill you or at least knock you out as potential competition. Well, well so coming back then to the question of should you not, give, given, if you accept that premise that intelligence implies belligerence, should you not antagonize the giant crown of thorns uh, spaceship? So the answer the book provides, uh, which is partly just to get the plot going, but is, I think, valid, is they show up when the giant crown of thorns Rorschach is still growing. It's still putting itself together. Um, and I think the argument the captain, the vampire makes is... Uh, they're not ready for us. This is our only chance to learn anything about them on our terms. Because in, I think eventually he puts a clock on it, like 15 days, the aliens are going to have their shit so well put together that they're going to be invincible. They might as well be God. Um, so we got to go over there and start rummaging through their drawers right now. <laughs> and I mean, I think one of the things that this book does really, really well also is just like, in, in a way that I haven't seen in a lot of, 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 of this kind of, of story is like establishing that, like, we are not here to survive. Like we didn't come out here with a plan to get back alive. Like we, 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 we embarked on this mission with the full understanding that um, we, our survival is not the point of this mission. And, and that's why there's a vampire in charge um, to make sure that we don't do anything stupid, like prioritize our, ourselves instead of the planet. And so like within the world, of the story, um, you know, I'm fully on board for like, this is deeply stupid, but I fully understand why they're doing, why they're, why they're boarding the, the nightmare ship again. Um, because, you know, we, we have, we got, we got one chance here. Um, and if we, uh, if we, we, we might die, but if we don't, if we fuck this up, then everyone's going to die. Well, well, right. I guess if intelligence implies belligerence, then you have nothing to lose by giving, by, by by giving everything you can, resisting it, because there is not going to be any accommodation or a you know peaceful resolution anyway. So even if it's a small chance, you might as well take it. Yeah, because technology implies belligerence goes both ways, right? We have technology, right? Yes, okay, they came and they they are uh, if if they're so sophisticated, that means they might be a threat. But also, we we are belligerent. We it is in our nature to. Um, destroy things um, that might be a threat, even if they're not a threat. Um, so, yeah, it's fully, fully in keeping with with uh, with who we are. Okay, and so then toward the end of the book, the vampire character Sarasti, out of nowhere, kind of maims um, our main character, Siri Keaton. And it's very um, unexpected in the moment. And it's about 20 pages before we even revisit the, the question of why he did that. And I'm still a little confused about that. So does anybody have a uh, explanation for why Sarasti attacks Keaton at that point? So I will say every time I read the, reread this book is the time I think I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> uh, so it's not just that you weren't paying attention. It is very confusing. Well, I will say that when I read it, all I could think was, oh, thank God Seth is going to explain this. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Damn it. Um... I mean, I can put up my guess, but. Yeah, well, let me just give a little bit more context. So um, 
at the very toward the very end, like on the last couple of pages, I think um, Keaton tells us, "I can't miss Jaka Sarasti. God knows I try. Every time I come online, he saved my life. He humanized me." So I I sort of get the impression that somehow this was done to uh, somehow undo the uh, effects of the radical hemispherectomy in order to make him a more compelling witness to people back on Earth about what has happened with these aliens. Is that on the right track at all? Yeah, I think so. Um, It's frustrating because many characters in the book, including Siri, talk about what happened like they understand the purpose, but it's never quite made clear to the reader. Um, My feeling is that there's this great scene very brief in the book where they introduce the concept of blindsight. Uh, a character can't see, but he keeps saying, throw me a ball, throw me a ball. Um, they're inside the alien ship and their brains are like being jammed by the power of the electromagnetic field. Uh, and someone tosses him a ball and he catches it. And he explains that blindsight is a form of blindness where your eyes work fine, but your conscious mind has lost connection to visual information. Um, so you think you're blind because you're not aware of your sight, but if you force your body to guess, to just reach out and grab, a lot of the time you'll catch the ball anyway. I think that Siri throughout a lot of this book, our protagonist has a kind of emotional blind sight where he's actually a pretty normal guy, you know, as nerds raised on the internet in the future (laughs) go, but he has very human responses to things. And then he'll often do something very human and then make up a reason that it was the result of his brain surgery or that it was such an inhuman thing to do. I think he has a kind of emotional blindsight for a lot of the book where he has convinced himself he's not a person and that he's only pretending to be a person, but he still manages to fake it well enough. I think what Sarasti, the vampire's attack, is meant to do is force him to do the mental equivalent, the emotional equivalent of just reaching out blindly and grabbing that ball to trust his gut, to act on something deeper than his like very rational upper mind and just feel, just think. Um, So yeah, David, I, I do think you were on the right track in saying it was kind of a counteractive to his, at least what he thought his hemispherectomy had done to him. It's still very confusing and weird to read. And, uh, you know, I took a bunch of quotes down when I was rereading. But it's not, I'm not 100% that I understand it. Um, The most important thing, I think, that we're supposed to take from the attack uh, is that it's the catalyst for Siri to actually understand the aliens. Um, And I think the one thing I'm sure of there is that Sarasti physically attacks and mutilates Siri to put him in pain and to demonstrate that the fact that he's conscious that he's in pain is a survival disadvantage. Uh, Cause you know, at the same time, they're basically torturing the aliens to, to force them to respond um, to their research. Uh, and Sarasti, the vampire points out that the aliens don't do any worse at the tasks they're set, even though they're being tortured, it doesn't affect their performance. Whereas when Siri is, you know, struck by a vampire and clawed open, he's basically useless. Uh, So I think the surface level punchline, aside from everything else, is like the fact that we are conscious of being in pain is a disadvantage for humans. Okay. Uh, I have a bunch more questions, but I don't don't know if I want to just turn this into like a &A, Q&A with Seth. (laughs) I want to get other people in here as well. Um, But so, so Teresa, is there anything else, just anything else about the book that you want to talk about that you liked or that stuck in your memory or, or anything like that? Well, I mean, it really, you know, kind of jumping off of what Seth was saying and thinking about the ending and why Siri was made to be kind of the last survivor. I don't know if we want to get into that. Yeah, sure. Yet, sure or, you know, it, yeah, I, I agree. I think he has a blind sight for himself because, yeah, he's constantly saying, I have no emotion. I ha-, you know, he's making these self deprecating, like half a brain jokes a lot. And, you know, but I think a lot of it comes from, 
willfully ignoring the pain that he's in over Chelsea and how that relationship ended with her her death and how that really affects him and if he was as you know cold as he says um you know that wouldn't be the case that it would affect him as much and I thought it was interesting to present Siri as a sociopath and then Sarasti as the vampire in like a contrast to each other and what that really means because I think you know similar to the way the aliens were really alien the vampire aspects were presented really you know in a, in this terrifying manner of Sarasti doesn't speak a lot because predators are usually silent to not scare their prey um the way their eyes work um that the way they kind of stalk around I thought it was like excellent addition to vampire canon. Um, sorry, I just I lost. The, well, the let there. me ask you, <laughs> just 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 picking up on that. I mean, so what happens at the end of the book is that yeah, is that basically the um, the Theseus, the human ship, self destructs, blowing up the alien ship uh, Rorschach, and uh, Siri is the only survivor. He's on a shuttle back to Earth to to report on what happened. But on the way back, he's getting these transmissions from Earth and gradually gets the idea that back on Earth, the vampires have taken over and are exterminating the normal people. And so he's left in the, you know, in the closing pages of the book with the for first, the disconcerting notion that maybe he's the last sentient being in the universe because the the vampires and the aliens and and all is, are all these super intelligent non you know non self aware sorts of intelligences and then he's sort of wondering well maybe I'm not even <laughs> or he's he's writing down in his log anyway maybe I'm not even self aware either uh due to my you know uh having half my brain removed and and all this stuff so what did you think uh as you were turning the last page of the book Teresa kind of what was your uh, reaction um holy shit <laughs> <laughs> basically just being like oh my you know um yeah just kind of like wow at the at the end of all of this he's the last the last man standing as far as we all know and then just kind of thinking about what that means for you know the future of the planet with um what the aliens are you know what they're going to find you know, if they come back. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you should go to somebody else. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, how about Sam? What did you, what did you think of the the way the book ended? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's such a, it's such a flex. It's such a, like a, a boss move <laughs> um, because like the entire book, you're thinking in the back of your brain, wait, why did we bring vampires back from the dead? Like, I know they're real smart and they can think real fast and there are conceivable circumstances where that would be great but like that seems like a really bad idea like like that the, why that seems like yeah and so then in the very end you're like also the vampires took over um and 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 they're gonna and now we're doomed um so so yeah it's sort of like you know showing it to you you're, you're, you're supposed to see it you're supposed to think it you're supposed to wonder about it and and it's almost like a like, oh, yeah, also, you've spent this whole book thinking it's about um, saving humanity uh, from aliens. And, like, in the end, it's like, well, maybe we saved the uh, humanity from aliens because based on game theory, they won't come back. But they could totally come back. But also, it doesn't matter because the vampires took over. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was, I was uh, pretty, pretty impressed. Was there anything else, Sam, that you uh, that you wanted to talk about, or that stuck in your mind, or that you really liked in the book? Um. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> let me, me think about. It. Yeah. Yeah. Let you? me. Let me. All right. Well, let me let me pitch Seth another question or two, and you can think about that. So, um, so Seth, there's also this idea that the aliens interpret all language as an attack. Uh, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So it's not all language, specifically human language. Uh, 
And I love that. To me, it's the punchline of the book. Because you were asking earlier, like, why should we screw with these super powerful aliens who live on a super gas giant and are building this incredibly horrifying looking construct? Um, And the reason that's eventually revealed in the book is they think we attacked first. Um, It's implied maybe they even came here to to deal with us. Um, Because not being conscious, not being self-aware... Um, when the aliens picked up our, you know, transmissions, our radio, our television, our culture, uh, and deciphered them, they found all this content, um, about human experience. Like, uh, I feel bad that World War II is happening or, you know, to really appreciate the symphonies of Mozart, you've got a blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Um, and the aliens again, not having any self-awareness, not having a concept of experiencing something, uh, analyze this. And they're like, so there's a ton of material here that is designed to create internal experience with no external like correlate. It's not a set of instructions on how to survive better. It's not like information on why you shouldn't fuck with our solar system. It's just a waste of time. Uh, And they interpret this as a virus. And they think basically that Earth is broadcasting malicious um information out into the cosmos as a way to try to slow down and confuse um competition so to the scramblers um into rorschach and i think it's not actually clear how much the scramblers are the aliens or whether they're just kind of like parts of rorschach that it builds um but the alien intelligence is already thinks that we're like screwing with them um, I mean, so sorry, Seth, is, is it not basically stated that the intelligence is distributed through all the scramblers? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Um, but the scramblers don't work without the fields that Rorschach generates. Like, Yeah, I also interpreted them as being like they could be things that it just constructs as needed. Right. I think that's a that's a good thing to think about, but orthogonal to the question of yeah. like, the aliens interpreting our language as an attack. Um, They basically see it as like um, the way a virus will, a COVID virus, as I've been dealing with lately, uh, you know, will sidle up to a human cell and inject its own genetic information into that cell and be like, Hey, check this out, make copies of it, make copies of it. And you know, it's not good for the cell. It's not good for the organism that the cell is part of. Um, Similarly, the scramblers looking at human uh, language are like, all this information here is just devoted to like, think about me, think about thinking about me, think about what it's like to think this makes no sense to a scrambler. It's like, this is a viral attack. Um, it's the mental equivalent of of viral DNA. Um, and to me like, Oh, that's such a cool fucking idea. I wish I'll have one idea that cool Hmm. in my whole career to me that like that paragraph where Siri finally figures out why the aliens are, you know, maybe not why they're here, but why they don't like us. Um, what they think of us is like just the punchline of the whole book. Um, without that, I think the book would be enormously lessened with it. I think it's just, oh, it just hits so hard because we never, never, uh, as humans interacting with other humans, we never have a reason to stop and be like, hey, what am I spending all my energy and time thinking about? Like, I feel bad. I I feel hungry. Why do I need to feel hungry? Why don't I just go get the food I need? Um, we don't interact with aliens. So like we have no reason to compare our way of thinking and experiencing the world with others. But what this book does is like grab you by the shoulders and, and be like, humans aren't normal. We're not the inevitable way that cognition has to work. And now like building these AIs, these neural nets and whatever, you know, people love to talk to them and be like, Oh, because they can um, complete strings. Like I can talk to them and they can generate a text string back to me. They must be self-aware. They must be, uh, there must be something going on in there. We're almost unable to think about minds without assuming that uh, consciousness goes with cognition. Um, And I think we're going to have to confront the fact, you know, as we keep working on our large language models or whatever, that it's possible to make a very smart system that has not an inkling of self-awareness. Well, let me also, I mean, if you're speaking of AIs, that's another twist that kind of comes up right at the end of the book is this idea that actually Sarasti was always being controlled, puppet-like, by the ship's AI, and that actually this 
this whole um, conflict between humans and aliens has actually been a conflict between an AI and aliens, this conflict between two super intelligent, non, you know, non self-aware systems and that all the human characters were all just sort of um, ancillary or, you know, uh, chess pieces um, in this this battle between two superior um, intelligences. Yeah, it was like just when I thought this book couldn't give me any more to think about, then that happened and it was revealed and I was like, oh my God. Yeah, definitely need to read this again and see what I pick up. And it had been so long since I read it the first time where I actually kind of forgot about that with Sarasi and the, and the Captain AI. Um, oh God. <laughs> like, Yeah, that really... Um, raise the stakes like again and again and again it was like right at the very end so was this pretty much what you expected based on your memories of it or was it did it did it seem different than you expected in any way or than you remember it in any way well i mean it was definitely um complex like really complex inscrutable in a lot of parts to me but his prose i think but just on a sentence level like peter watts voice i think is very clear and strong so when i was confused by plot elements it was his prose that pulled me through again you know something like william gibson or gene wolf you know where i'm not fully comprehending but you know what i love about peter watts novel is you know he always does have these difficult characters who um you know, I feel like a lot of them, he has a lot of empathy for um, abuse of survivors and trauma. And all of the characters really, well, most of the characters on the ship really have that in their background. I mean, I think it's something that was very explicit in the Rifters series, which is, again, like kind of a, a group of misfits go to the bottom of the ocean, which may as well be as foreign and out there as outer space. And they're under literal thousands of tons of pressure. And that's kind of the metaphor for how they react and perform. And I thought Blind Sight was very similar in that respect. So it's like on the surface, Peter Watts always has this kind of misanthropic kind of way of talking about humans in the future. And it seems not a lot of hope. Um but it is in there and how the characters react to each other, how they play off of each other. You know, it's, it's human and it, it feels realistic, like well-drawn and, and there is an underlying empathy under there. If there's not always hope. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I, I sent you guys some YouTube videos. So one is called blind sight sci-fi short film, which is sort of like a fan a really, really awesome fan trailer for Blind Sight. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah, and then there's one called Taming Yesterday's Nightmares for a Better Tomorrow, <laughs> which is a like lecture narrated by it's narrated by Peter Watts, but it's as if it's a uh, the you know the people who resurrected the vampires genetically uh, talking about how they did it. So, uh, so Teresa, you watched you watched at least the the trailer. Yeah, I watched the trailer, which, um, yeah, it was only like five minutes long. Definitely go check it out. I thought it was um, really beautiful to look at. It had some really great elements, you know, little bits that were favorite scenes from the book, like Siri not seeing the scrambler in front of him. Um, yeah, and I watched some of the lecture. It was like 35 minutes yeah. long. <laughs> I only watched I, the first couple of minutes, so. Yeah, so. me too. I, I watched maybe another five minutes of that, and I'm like, Happy for you. Happy you did all your research. I'm good. I get I get enough. I ha I've had enough of that. <laughs> but I really, you know, going to Peter Watts Rifter's website, everything, like, there is so much there. <laughs> there is so much supplementary material for, I think, all of his novels, really. Um, it's a really great resource worth checking out and seeing how deeply deeply he thought about all of this um, and it's cool to see that other people were so interested in it uh, that they made their own fan movie and like raised money and got a bunch of you know computer 
designers to get like artists together to work on something like this just for for the love yeah, absolutely. And it did make me real. I, he, I saw him say in an interview that this is being, the blind side is being developed as a film. So I don't know, um, you know, how, yeah, how soon I mean, that I, might happen. But I, I think that would be, that would be really great because it is such an amazing story. But it is, it, you know, reading the, the book requires a certain, as I was saying, requires a certain level of, uh, you know, background knowledge and, and dedication. So it would be cool if, um, if the story could also be available in a, a little bit more of an accessible form for uh, for more general audience. Um, see, Sam, any uh, anything you want to add here? Yeah, uh, one of the things I, I was thinking as I was reading this was I don't know if this is an artifact of his optimism or an artifact of two thousand and six, um, but like this idea that AI has made us all redundant and that's great, right? That AI has like replaced most jobs and that means that people can do fun stuff and like you could just go upload yourself into a computer if that's your thing um, and live in VR in eternity. Um, But also like most people just have like chill, redundant jobs. Like there's the great line about like the mother judging series father for not choosing a redundant job. Um, Like, so yeah, this idea that like AI would come along and not mean that like rich people will use it to make everyone else's lives harder and more difficult and like, you know, make things more expensive and increase income inequality um, is really interesting to me. It felt very naive is not the right word, but it felt like a delight. Like I couldn't possibly imagine telling that story that sort of like having that as like a background element to the story um, in a, in something written today. Um, but, but, it, but, but uh, it's lovely. Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll, you know, there will be some some way that the the automation. I mean, because that's that sort of there's two the two ways it could go, right? The we're all freed from drudgery, or we're just all, you know, rendered uh, superfluous, you know, and we sort of we're sort of at an inflection point um, for those two yeah. futures. Yeah, absolutely, and. Yeah, so the journey to to veer away from the we are all rendered impoverished and and um, and shackled by by AI and technology to we are you know we enjoy a higher quality of life and we can not stress out about things. Um, it would require it would itself be the subject of a novel. It's it's hard to sort of like picture that as like a background uh, transition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in here that I feel like could. <laughs> could be its own novel, you know, a lot of the ideas in here. Yeah. What Seth said about like, if I could have one idea this strong, it would make my career. Like there's like dozens of things in here and not just the science. Cause the science is great. And there's lots of great science fictional things, but also just like plot points and character things like, um, you know, Siri is such a, a, people have pointed to this already. Like, um, I don't know, maybe this is my damage, but like Siri seems pretty human to me because like every bit of internal angst he has about like, is this right? Is this what humans do? Is this how, those are all things (laughs) that I think every day over and over again. (laughs) Um, So yeah, Um, thinking that you are a emotionless robot um, is possibly the most human (laughs) uh, uh, thing I can, I can connect with in this, in this book. Well, well, speaking of AI, let me let me throw Seth one more question. So, because um, I'm not a hundred percent sure I, I got this. So, so you mentioned Seth that Amanda Bates, the soldier character, has these grunts, these sort of um, drones that she controls. Um, and there's a part in the book where we find out. I gather that they actually fight better without her. And um, if she were to be taken out, that it would just be they would just operate faster and more efficiently or effectively. Um, and so Siri says, uh, Spindle had had it all wrong. Amanda Bates wasn't a sop to politics. Her role didn't deny the obsolescence of human oversight at all. Her role depended on it. She was more cannon fodder than I. She always had been. Um, can you just, what does that mean? She was more cannon fodder than I. I'm not 100% sure I'm getting getting that part. Yeah, I mean, I'm not 100% sure I am either. I definitely noted that down on my last reread um, for this podcast. The way I read it is that um, she's almost a a decoy, like um, in the same way that Siri gets sent along on the missions to Rorschach because it just increases the odds that, uh, you know, if the aliens are going to shoot at a random member of the crew, 
um, having Siri there, you know, increases the chance they'll shoot someone useless. <laughs> um, although I think that's Siri being a little hard on himself. Um, I, it doesn't, you know, I'm rolling it over in my head. You know, the idea that she's there is like um, the first thing the enemy shoots so that the, the grunts can perform it you know, their own autonomous, uh, higher efficiency. It doesn't really make sense to me. Like, why don't you just make them efficient in the first place? Um, it's something I would, I would want to think about a bit more to really get. I will say that as much as the book and maybe even Siri concludes, the grunts would be better off without her there. There are several points in the book where the grunts get hacked or misdirected or overridden and, her being there in person as a human, um, you know, does seem to make a difference. Uh, so I think maybe she's being a little hard on herself or Siri's being a little hard on her. Uh, this is something the Orthoquel, not really sequel, um, uh, Echopraxia gets into a little. There's value to having basic humans around because they're so dumb and so tough that it's kind of hard to hack or misdirect them the same way that like a mechanical doorknob can be with a lock can be more secure. Say a deadbolt, a deadbolt can be more secure than a fancy electronic lock just because there are fewer ways to interact with it. Um, I don't think that really answered your question, but uh, it's the best I got. Yeah. Well, if anyone listening uh, understands, understands that, uh, you know, let me know, uh, you know, hit me up on Twitter or, or whatever. Um, Can I just say thanks, Seth? Because I've never heard Orthoquil before. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just, go just Google that. It's fully a thing. Thank you. Yeah. Did you make that up or is that a thing? No, Seth? it's fully no, a thing. I think I learned it from the Arthur Clarke 2001 sequels. I think that's what he called them. Okay, so so uh, so just to just to explain for a listener, so so yeah, so um, there's this fire uh, blindside is one of the two books in the Firefall sequence, and ec the second one is Echopraxy, and I guess it's not a sequel because it doesn't come after it's orthogonal or an orthoquel because it happens around the same time. Am I? Yeah, it's interpreting in that a way? in a very different part of the um, the world. There are some connections. There are links to each other, but it can be read as its own book. And it's it's not like it picks up five hours after Blindside Ends or something. Okay. Do you want to say just like one sentence, one or two sentences about what the premise of Echopraxy is? No. Uh, I haven't reread it much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Um, a man goes on a trip to the sun because something weird is happening there. Okay, that's so, all I remember. Okay, am I? Uh, uh, I'm getting the idea that this is maybe even more um, impenetrable than Blindside is. Um, I would have to reread it. I think to the extent that people find it impenetrable, it's because rather than a character like Siri, who I think is a really clever choice for Blindside's um, narrator, because Siri's job is to communicate things without understanding them. So he kind of gives you permission to read blind sight without understanding everything that's happening. You know, if you read a passage about neurotransmitters or whatever, the fact that Siri's whole thing is not having to know the details kind of gives you as the reader permission to not worry too much about the details and just focus on the vibes, which I think you can do with blind sight. It's a great book. The narrator of uh, Echopraxia, Daniel Brooks, I think is his name, is just a regular old guy. And I would say for 95% of the book, he has no idea what is happening uh, or why anything is occurring. So you're just kind of on the ride with him. And I found that confusing. I think many readers probably find it confusing. I'm hesitant to like just dong on the book without rereading it because uh, it may be I was not a good reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because I used to be, I mean, I, I used to be more sort of able to go with the flow reading a book and if i wasn't getting stuff i it didn't bother me so much and i've gotten more and more sort of obsessive about understanding every sentence and especially if i'm going to be talking about it on a podcast i want to you know understand everything but i definitely think uh blind sight if, if you're able if you're able to kind of go with the flow um you know that's probably the ideal uh 
uh, angle to approach this book from because it's it's not a book you're probably going to be able to understand every single thing that's every single sentence you know at least certainly not on in my in my experience not on one read anyway um i guess i also just mention um peter watts i thought it was kind of interesting in his uh like afterward he says that uh uh, he says, parts of blind sight can be thought of as a rejoinder to arguments presented in Carl Schrader's novel, Permanence. Uh, I haven't read that, but it makes me kind of curious to read that now, knowing uh, there's that connection between the two novels. Yeah, I haven't read it either. Me either. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> well, I, like, I like Carl Schroeder. Yeah, you know, he's he's great. He's a, yeah, he's also like super super smart and, you know, he's a professional futurist and uh um yeah, def definitely uh, in that yeah, super smart hard SF uh, you know, world. Um all right, so but we're pretty much out of time, so I think we are going to need to start wrapping this up. So, uh Sam, any final thoughts on this whole experience of reading Blindsight? I really loved it. I thought it, it was like, it was like it had, it had brains and heart, which, you know, I, I usually only want heart, but if you do it a good <laughs> enough job, I want, I'll take the brains. Um, and yeah, it was really, it was really creepy and scary and smart and good. Thank you for giving me a reason to read it. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for volunteering to, to read it, even though you'd never read it before. So I wasn't the only one. Uh, I'd follow you anywhere, David. <laughs> Uh, how about Teresa? Final thoughts. Um, all right. One thing, Peter Watts has probably the one of the best author blurbs I've ever read. And it, it always stuck with me from like his first novel. Every time I feel the will to live becoming too strong, I read some Peter Watts. <laughs> yeah, I, that, yeah. <laughs> I love that one Amazing. you know it, it really put it in that head you know that that headspace of you know his i i just recommend peter watts his fiction just wholeheartedly because it's so rewarding to be challenged in the way that he he challenges you to get out of that you know if you're someone like me who doesn't read a lot of books in that genre he still has these genre tropes that he plays with that are super, super fun and engaging. And his prose, I think, you know, just the 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 dialogue, the jokes, there's something very dry and funny to a lot of his his way of describing situations, describing people, that I think there's a, a lot of worth there. And for Blindside in particular, I loved some space horror. And this is yet another um, space horror media that has convinced me. I never, ever, ever want to go to outer space. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Like, have at it. Have fun. I'll stay down here on Earth with the vampires and the internet run amok because there is nothing for me up there. It's funny you mention his bio because I, I was just looking at his bio in, in my edition of Blindside I have here. And it says, his work is available in 21 languages and has appeared in 29 dozen best of the year anthologies. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of best of the year anthologies. I, I have to wonder if it originally said like two dozen best of the year anthologies and they changed it to 29 without <laughs> realizing that they hadn't taken out the dozen. But uh, or do you think has his work appeared in 29 dozen <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a lot. Of, <laughs> I mean, he deserves it as far as I'm concerned, but I just don't know if there even are that many. But uh, I mean, I guess if he's counting like all different languages and territories where he's published, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'd buy it. I believe yeah. it. He's, he's would incredibly you just say talented. 30, would you just say, just round it. At that point, just round it up to 30 dozen, you know, <laughs> or several hundred or something. Anyway. Well, I think we've already established he likes to be very specific. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. So Seth, final thoughts. I mean, I love blind sight. Um, I love space horror. It doesn't have to be smart. You know, I'll watch event horizon every year. So mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, we've talked a lot about the ideas of this book, but it is a work of fiction. First and foremost, he didn't write it as a, you know, a monogram monograph or a paper. And it's just a damn good spooky space book. It will scare the shit out of you. 
Uh, and that to me like matters more than anything else. Um, I, there are other Watts, you know, I, sorry, Peter, if you're listening to this, there are other Watts books that I'm like, this went a little too far for me. The later Rifters books, like there's a subplot about a serial killer. I just couldn't read. Um, but blind sight, like just really, it's in the Goldilocks zone for me. Uh, so often with horror, it, you get a wonderful opening and then it all falls apart when they reveal, you know, the monster or the killer or whatever. This ship and has been to hell. <laughs> yeah. And it's even harder to do in science fiction because there's such a, you know, for a literature of imagination, such a small set of answers that usually gets given to the questions like, what are the aliens like? Oh, they're a hive mind. Oh, they're, um, they're nanites. Oh, you know, th there's not a lot really new. And so even though Blindsight is more than a decade old at this point, uh, well more than, um, like it's just one of those books I read where I was like, ah, oh, damn, I have never read anything like this before. Um, and I crave that, you know, if anybody else finds more stuff like that, send it to me. Uh, and it was such a prescient book. Well, science fiction is always accused of being prescient, but like it was prescient about things that not many people were like, Hey, uh, we're going to have to deal with the problem of making super smart systems that are nothing like people. You know, how are we going to think ethically and morally about our big data AI that has no reason to care about life, except that it's reward function, like has hopefully been trained to, to reward it when it doesn't kill things. Um, yeah. Damn good book. I like it a lot. Yeah, I mean, in her introduction, Elizabeth Barrett calls this the best hard science fiction novel of the first decade of the 21st century. And, um, you know, there are a lot of hard science fiction novels of the first decade of the 21st century I haven't read, but uh, I have no trouble believing that's true. Um, it certainly would have to be up there. Uh, and like I said, I mean, I, um, you know... So some of the time I found the the ideas more compelling than the like the characters or or whatever, but um the ideas are so amazingly great that um it, it just makes this you know a must read science fiction novel, um and uh, you know just 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 be aware going in you might not get <laughs> get everything on a first reading. Something I really admire about it is there is so much advice. Um, in any art about the uncanny or the weird or the creepy that the less you reveal, the better. There's even this mystery box ideology and like, you know, JJ Abrams where the box is always more interesting when it's closed, you know, um, you give hints to the monster, but you don't show it. And one thing I really admire about this book, even though I think it has its structural problems is that he opens the box up all the way. <laughs> and his answer to like the reader's imagination of what is inside the box is always going to be scarier than what you show them is no, I imagine something even scarier. Here it is. Take a look. <laughs> Here's my footnotes. Um, I really admire that, that he was just like, no, I, I will reveal everything. And what I reveal is going to be so upsetting that it's going to make the whole book. Um, that allows me to forgive a lot of, you know, I think the last act is quite hard to follow structurally, but the book just has this, uh, I don't know how to pronounce chutzpah. Hootspa. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It really just goes for it. Um, I, that buys it a lot of points. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. I think that's a perfect note to end on. So why don't we wrap things up there? So we've been speaking with Teresa DeLucci, Sam J. Miller, and Seth Dickinson. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Teresa DeLucci, Sam J. Miller, and Seth Dickinson for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program... 
tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.